Amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team, for leading us this morning. That was a gift. He is alive. Worthy of celebrating. This has a, been a party in here already, huh? Like, when do you get a confetti cannon in church? Really? That was awesome. So praise God for a, a reason to, to celebrate. Well, I'm glad you chose to be with us this morning. And look, you could have been just laying in bed doing nothing, but instead you got to come be a part of this. So praise the Lord for that. We're uh, excited to be just this, this week and diving into uh, the conclusion. If you're new here, you're like, conclusion? I'm, I'm just showing up. But this is the end of a series that we've been working through in the book of uh, Galatians, and we're going to be uh, diving into that. I was thinking this week, well, maybe I could come up with something really profound to say. Then I was like, oh yeah, I don't have anything profound to say, but we'll study God's Word because that is profound. But in context of our, our morning and the topic, I was thinking in terms of different things that, that get us fired up and get us worked up and, and riled up, what it is that, that gets us, gets our, our blood boiling, our, our heart racing, and, and different people, as you think about it, and you can be honest with yourself, different people respond differently to stimuli in the world. When things get them uh, that blood boiling, they respond differently. In fact, psychologists, they kind of put people in different groups, and maybe you can identify what group you find yourself being placed in. One group is this, how they respond to stimuli is exploders. This is the person that doesn't take a whole lot to set them off. Like usually you're driving next to that person in traffic, right? Like this person, like it, it, their fuse is like this short. Like, uh, uh, yeah, so, so some might even uh, attribute that to different ethnicities. I don't know. I'm not going to say that. But uh, so maybe you fall in that in that group that you're an exploder. Another category might be somebody that describes themselves as a stuffer, like that, that you just choose to, to hold it in, hold it in. Like it takes a lot to really get you uh, worked up. That's the entire country of Canada. And, uh, <laughs> and, and so my wife's Canadian. I can say that. Uh, and, and so uh, that that person, like, it, it takes a lot, man. They they just keep taking it, they're taking it. But eventually, a lot of times, you'll notice that person becomes an exploder, right? They they've had that that build up and pent up. And a lot of us might say, like, man, I don't really know what category I fall into. Anybody like that? You're like, you know, I think I'm more of a perfect blend. I like to keep them guessing. Anybody else like that? Anybody's like, you never know what you're gonna get with me. Like whether it's going to be a stuffing day or it's going to be an exploding day. And uh, and as I was thinking about that in context to our our text this morning, this is something for Paul that he's had. He I would probably label him a little bit more of as a, of an exploder, probably more than a stuffer. Maybe he let the, some things build, but there's things that happen in life that are worthy of getting fired up about. This entire book of Galatians is a, a letter that Paul wrote to a church that he started. Some things that are worthy of getting fired up about that he was writing to the Galatians. And the thing that was getting him fired up or stirred up was this idea of where we place our hope for salvation, where we place our hope for salvation. What are we actually clinging to for how we're, when we stand before Almighty God and every single one of us, that moment of time is going to come some sooner than others. And, uh, and, and when we stand before him, what are we putting our hope in? It's a question that I'm proposing here this morning uh, that each one of us on uh, Easter 2014, that you wouldn't leave here today without identifying what it is that you're putting your hope in. Really, if you're going to break it down into a nutshell, world religions, no matter what the name or title that you place on it, they really fall under two categories of where you place your hope in. One possibility, and this is one option for us in our 70, 80, 100 years here on earth, is to put your hope in your own efforts and good works, trying to achieve something, trying to keep a, a list of rules. And there's tons of religions out there that have their own list. I mean, but still, when you boil it down, that's what it comes down to, meeting a certain standard to appeal, to appease God, to please God. is what we. That's one option of where we place our hope. And that's what Paul is confronting, is that he's like, wait a second, these false teachers, that's what they're presenting, this option of something done in the flesh. Or the other option, if you're to break down all world religions in two categories, is the second category is, is that you're putting your faith and your hope and your trust 
in Jesus' work on the cross. Jesus' work on the cross, saying, coming to the conclusion that it's not me, I'm never going to meet some kind of a perfect standard, I'm always going to keep falling short, coming to that conclusion and putting your hope in him. And so this morning, my prayer is, for us, it's pretty simple this morning, is just wrestle through and come to a conclusion of where are you placing your hope? That's what Easter is all about. Where are you placing your hope? on your works, your effort, your, your human achievement, or God's divine accomplishment through Jesus Christ. So I'm going to pray towards that end, and then we're going to dive into the text. God, we thank you so much this morning for a chance to already celebrate you in a number of different ways, from old hymns to confetti cannons to the beauty of kids singing about your kindness and goodness to us. We pray that this morning would put a smile on your face. We pray now that you would just speak through this text, that I would be small and you would be great, and that no one here today would leave without at least wrestling through that question, where am I placing my hope? What is it in? What is it in? We invite you here now in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, if you have your, your Bibles with you, this would be a good time to pull those out. And the nice thing is, if you don't have a Bible with you, we have one in the chair in front of you. It's going to be a lot easier to make sense out of this whole morning's uh, uh, passage if you're actually following along. And the nice invitation if you're a guest here and you're like, I don't even own a Bible. Well, guess what? That one that's in the chair in front of you, take it home with you. It's our gift to you as a, as a, a, a tender here this morning. So... Let's dive in. We're in the book of Galatians. We're in chapter 6. It's kind of about three-fourths through the Bible, if you're looking for it. And we're going to see, this is Paul speaking, as I mentioned. He's talking to the, this church in Galatia that had kind of wandered and kind of done, was wandering and doing its own thing and wandered from what he's taught them. Verse 11, we start with this. He says, See with what large letters... I'm writing to you with my own hand. Just pause there just briefly. What a lot of, some degree of debate over what's happening there. Typically, some, someone probably say that he's saying, instead of going through a scribe, which was how you'd usually write something, is somebody writing it down for you as you speak. This is, this is Paul at the end of the letter, kind of his signature saying, I'm writing with my own hand to authenticate this, to show the importance of this. Or others believe that he's just saying, listen, this is just going in all caps and all bold to emphasize the importance of this. It's kind of, we tease my mom growing up. My mom would take a Hallmark card and any card that was written, she would like, she'd pick the words that she wanted to emphasize. I don't know if anybody else does this double, triple underline things and exclamation points and stars and X's and O's. By, by the time you got the card, you're like, what happened here? Like, because everything was meant to have some kind of a bold or emphasis. Either way, whether it was him writing this with his own hand or if it's all in bold, the point is that as he's concluding this letter, he's trying to say, listen, what I'm saying here is super important. Do we got that? A lot of times today, like our version of that is emoticons. Anybody do the texting? And you're like, I don't even use words. I just use symbols. Like, so this is Paul saying, listen, this is, this is critical. This is important that you understand. So that being the, the, out of the offset uh, of the text there. So verse 12, he continues on. And he starts to describe one of the two options that we already talked about for placing our hope. He starts talking about putting your hope in works. He's exposing the folly of depending on human effort. Verse 12, it is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that you may boast in your flesh. Let's pause there. This, this section here I described, I titled it as putting on a show. Notice that it says, those who want to make a good showing in the flesh. For honest, many people fall into this category and we can slip into it if we're not careful where we're really concerned with the way that the outside looks and not much concern about the inside. 
my uh, family teases me. In fact, my whole neighborhood kind of teases me because I, I have this issue where I like to wash my cars. Like I, I like, I like to wash the cars. Like I'm a little bit uh, strange with that. Probably once or at least once, maybe even twice a week. It's, it, it's weird. I've got issues. But what I've come to this conclusion uh, about, it's, it's like therapeutic for me. It's one thing I could actually get clean. And uh, it's, uh, uh, but I, I've come to realize with my wife's SUV, and we have three uh, young kids, at first, early on in ownership, I used to like detail the inside, take care of the outside. I mean, that, that thing was just like shiny. You guys can maybe attest to this in the newness of a, a car, a used car. Uh, but, but now I've kind of concluded after having three kids, I've kind of given up on the inside. Like I just kind of focus on as long as the outside looks good, we'll just kind of ignore what's going on inside. Like we'll, we'll disregard the gummy bears in between seats, you know, the extra a couple French fries. Those are usually pretty tasty uh, <laughs> that, that are left underneath the chair. You know what I mean? Like you, you, you hope. And in fact, when somebody's visiting with us, we're just like, you're not actually driving them somewhere, are you? You're, they're just going to look at the car from the outside. And, and the, the truth is, is, the truth is, is that picture is a lot of, of really, you can guess where that's going is a lot of how we approach religious acts, how we approach doing these different things that you're saying, like, I'm putting on a, a good show. I'm, I'm wanting as best as I can to, to appear this external expression. I'm wanting it to appear that I'm, I'm meeting a standard. Matthew 6, 1, Jesus cautions us, uh, uh, us about this. He says, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, in order to, to maybe carry some kind of a, a front or putting on a show. In that time period, the show that they were putting on, and it's kind of weird to talk about this on uh, Easter Sunday. You're like, we're really going to talk about circumcision on Easter Sunday. That's great. It's where the text took, to, t- took us this morning. But here, here's the idea is that what, what they were saying was that this this uh, tradition and this ritual that was part of Jewish heritage was something that you, they're saying, you need to do this, so it's Jesus plus this, in order to be saved. In fact, Acts 15.1 describes actually what they were teaching. It says, but some men came down from Judea, listen to this, and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Oh, that's, that's not subtle. That's not just sneaking in. That's like directly saying like, you're not saved. You're not, you're not, you're not at peace with God until you act out this item. But here the truth is in our culture, in our, our day, there's a lot of things that we add in that same list of religious activity, whether there's church uh, attendance or personal quiet time or your, your, your stance politically, whether you like uh, loud music or, or hymns. Like we've chosen a lot of different things as means of outward expression. But Paul's like, man, I'm not taking this. He's like, he's like I, I'm calling these uh, another point to why he's not a stuffer. Uh, but he's like, I'm going to call them out on what's actually happening here. What, is it, what does it say in, in the text that he says? It says, is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law. He's saying, listen, these guys, they're doing this. They're not even keeping the law themselves. They're just putting on a show. They're asking you to do something just so they can brag in the fact that they accomplished, they, they, they were able to convince you to do these things. If you think about it, for the Jewish person, think about what they're asking them to do. They're asking as an, as an adult, a Jewish adult, this, this wasn't much of a sacrifice to be circumcised. It was something that happened when they were a kid. They didn't remember it. So what happens is they pick the thing that they're like, I know what we can do. We can ask grown adult men to be circumcised. That's a great idea. Talk about a hoop to jump through. Like, really? Like, that's pretty cruel. So they're picking something that didn't require any degree of sacrifice on their, their behalf. Does that make sense? They're choosing something. I've already taken care of that. That's a piece of cake. But these guys, good luck with this one. And so no, no degree of sacrifice. And really, isn't that, that, that what we're left to when we're, when we're trying to meet some kind of a law or some kind of a standard? Is you're like, 
you're, all you're left to do is pick and choose maybe some laws that you're, you're going to try to follow and which one's not because really just a, a list of rules, you're like, I'm always going to fall short of meeting all of these. That's the status of our world around us. They can't meet all of the rules that God's put in place, so they pick and choose the ones that are what? Minimal sacrifice and no degree, what does it say there, of opposition. He's saying, I don't want to be persecuted for the cross. They want to find a nice blend, a nice happy medium that makes nobody upset, but it's actually no degree of sacrifice. Like Brian Loritz, he describes this person. He says, they want enough Jesus to make ourselves acceptable, but not enough to make us fanatical. Enough to make us acceptable, but not enough to make us fanatical. And that's really what the false teachers were doing at that time. There were no personal sacrifice, but also they were wanting to make sure there's no offense to the world around us. The truth is, when you've embraced the cross, when you've embraced the cross, it is offensive to the world around us. Anybody else notice that? I was talking to a, a woman after a service at another uh, church some years back, and uh, just talking to her, she's a school teacher, and she was explaining to me a situation where she was counseling one of her students, and she's like, you know what, I don't, I don't really know what to say to this student, because I'm not allowed to talk about God, I'm not allowed to bring up Jesus, I'm not allowed to point to the Bible, and she's like, I don't really know what to say. And I was like, guess what? It's like, you don't have anything you can say unless you choose the offense of the cross. Choosing to say like, you know what? I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to take a risk. And I was talking to her. I said, don't you think if you were to lose your teaching job because you spoke up for the name of Christ, do you think he's going to just abandon you? Do you think he's going to leave you like, oh, good luck with that? You know, like, no, that's not what it is. That's, that's not what it's about. But when you, you're putting on a show, you're doing your best to avoid all of these things that have potential offense to keep from being persecuted for the cross. Many are fine on Sunday singing Jesus songs and amening the preacher as long as there's no personal sacrifice or offense to others. God describes this person in Isaiah 29, 13. He says, This people that draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Here's the problem with putting on a show. Here's the problem with trying to pile up all these things that we're doing in our own flesh and our own effort is the problem is the audience, the one piece of audience, God, that matters, guess what? He's not impressed. He's Simon Cow. He doesn't like your performance. <laughs> like, it, like, like he's looking at where you're, you're bringing forward and he's like, nah, uh uh-uh, you're, you're, you're not, you're falling short because the standard is perfection. We're set up to fail. Does that make sense? Like that needs to sink in. And so what do you do? A lot of us are just like, well, what do I do if I, if I, can't, if I can't meet this perfect standard? If I, I, if I, can't, if I can't do it on my own, if, if he's never going to be satisfied, what do I do? What do I do? I have one word for us. One word for us. Quit. Quit. Just stop it. Stop trying to appease him. He's not ever going to be happy with your own self-effort. Quit. That doesn't, you, you won't ever see that on a Chevy truck commercial. That's not very American. Like, hey, guess what, everybody? You need to do is quit. Like, you're like, wait a second. That's so counter American. Yes, it is. That's why it's a problem. That's why so few people are willing to actually bend a knee because what is, what is human effort and religion? It gives you the opportunity of something to boast in, something to say, I did this, I accomplished this. But what Jesus is saying is, guess what? It's all a show. That's why we have to quit. That's why we have to quit and choose to boast instead in the cross. Quitting, putting on the show. Take a look in verse 14, what it says. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. I love this picture, this idea. Like, if you think about it, nobody really likes a braggart, somebody that brags a lot. 
And yeah, but, but then the ironic thing is, is all of us tend to brag. I'll confess, like I'm guilty of that too. I was, I was thinking, have you ever been in one of those conversations where you're in the middle of the conversation and you're realizing that you're boasting and you're like, it's almost like a separate where you're like, oh, how do I stop? How do I back out of this? I was at lunch with one of our elders on Friday and we we're just talking about traveling and I was getting excited. I was like, oh yeah, well, I've been here and I've been here. And then when I was on the safari in Africa and in the southern tip of China and like, and I, I was talking him and I was like, listen to myself. Like, that's silliness. Like, after I was reflecting on it a little bit later, I was like, that's obnoxious because bragging, and we're, it's real clear in Scripture in Jeremiah 9.23, like, that's not supposed to be something that we do. So you're like, wait, wait a second. If we're not supposed to do it, what is it talking about here when Paul says, but far be it from me to boast except in the cross? You see, the word boast there is different than the word brag or, or self-elevating. The word boast there, there's really no parallel English word for the word boast. The word bo boast there actually means rejoicing in, consumed by, or obsessed with. I like those pictures because that's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. And can you imagine the audience? What is he saying that he's boasting in? Can you imagine the audience at the time? He's saying, I'm boasting in the cross. That'd be modern day equivalent of saying, I'm boasting in the gas chamber, in the electric chair, in the noose. You know what I mean? Like you, you'd be like, what is up with this guy? Is that, are, are you deranged? Are you, are you a little bit crazy? Cuckoo. But, but no, what he's saying wasn't that, wasn't that he was boasting in the actual means that Jesus died. But he was, when he says the cross, he's boasting, he's referring to the entire work of what Jesus did, what he accomplished on the cross. If you're not familiar with it, this is what he did. God, perfect God, looked down at us in our fallen state, chose to not leave us in that fallen state, chose to come down as a man in the form of Jesus Christ, Live the perfect life without sin, flawless, perfect. Live the perfect life, allowed himself. And that's an important thing to understand. He wasn't taken because he couldn't stop it. Allowed himself to be taken, executed on a cruel Roman cross, put to death in our place for us because of what we have done and, and it we're described in 2 Corinthians 5, 20, 21. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He took our place on the cross, died as a payment, as a sacrifice for us, but then gave us a choice to either accept or reject that free gift. What do you want to do with it? Like, it's, he's a gentleman. He's not going to impose that on us, giving us a choice. And then didn't stay dead because otherwise we wouldn't be blowing confetti cannons here. He rose again on the third day, defeated death, and is now throned at the right hand of God the Father. It's an awesome truth. That's what Paul is boasting in. That's what Paul's saying. Hey, that's the thing that I'm consumed with. That's what I'm putting my trust in. That's what, I, that's what I'm clinging to more than anything else. You see, a lot of us are just like, what, what, you're only boasting in the cross? Like, that's kind of weird. Like, that sounds like a, a weird existence, just walking around. Here I am, boasting in the cross. It's the cross. Like, like a lot of people think of like, aren't there other things that we're allowed to like enjoy and, and, and think? But here's the, the truth of how that works. The truth of how that works to boast solely in the cross is that's the foundation for everything else that we enjoy here on earth. That's the groundwork. That's, the, that's the, the firm foundation that's laid out that allows us to enjoy lots of great things, family, friends, getting together in church like this, Easter celebrations. It's the foundation that lays it because otherwise, what are we left with? Otherwise, what are we left with? All we're left with is looming consequences for our actions. Apart from the cross, if he hadn't carried the weight of our sin and death, really, if you want to narrow down what a person's life is, they're just clock watching to see when they're going to stand before a righteous judge and receive their due punishment. 
You're like, wait a second, that's a, that's a pretty hopeless existence. Yes, it is. That's, that's the point that he's making. He says, that's why I boast in the cross. I was researching this week as kind of a, kind of a random thing to land on, not, maybe not so cheery on Easter, but there's 741 people in the state of California. This was a fact as of uh, this past fall. 741 people waiting on death row for their execution. Isn't that crazy? In the state of California, it's, it's like way more than any other state in the United States. The next closest was Florida with like 300 and something. And so, so in, this, in this state that we're in, 741 guys, can you imagine there? Do you think that's something they can kind of put on the shelf and be like, you know what? That doesn't really bother me anymore. Like, uh, I'm not really thinking about that. I'm just enjoying life, enjoying the, uh, all the things that life has to offer. No. It's not possible. Why? Because punishment, because, because it's, it's looming. That's, it's, it's that weight that's sitting there. If anybody's like me, I can't even enjoy a meal when there's some kind of conflict or issue with my wife. Anybody else like that with your spouse or somebody you care about? You're like, man, I can't even, sit, I can't even enjoy a chocolate chip cookie when I haven't solved or resolved something. And I enjoy chocolate chip cookies. Uh, like when I haven't worked through something with my wife. But amplify that a billion times when we're not right with God, how can we expect to enjoy anything else? How can we expect there to be joy in our life or peace or satisfaction or like all those things are absent if you're not boasting in the cross? Does that make sense? That's the foundation for everything else that we enjoy. That's why in 1 Corinthians 2, 2, Paul said, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ in him crucified. My question to us, just kind of as we're working through this, is my question is, what are you boasting in? What are you boasting in? What are you consumed with? What is it, what is it if you're to be honest with yourself, what is the thing that you're obsessed with? Is it, the, is, is it the cross? Is it what Jesus Christ has done on your behalf? Are there other things that have bumped up that priority in your own life? But when you do choose, when you make the choice to be consumed with what Jesus has done on your behalf, it changes everything. Let's take a look in the text. Changes everything. Verse 14, he says, But far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, and listen to this part, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. This picture that he points here, this, this, this dead to the world idea that he's painting there. You're like, wait a second, what does that actually mean? It doesn't mean numb to the world, but it's being free from the overwhelming pressure that this world creates that there's, okay, you need to do this to be satisfied. If you, if you experience this, then that's going to fulfill you. Once you get to this place in your career, once you have this house uh, in Agora Hills, once you have this, th- this never-ending rat race is what he's saying. I'm free from that. I'm done with that. Like it no longer has reign over me. What a gift that is, right? Anybody else ready to just be done with all that? Anybody else like, oh, like it'd be so nice to be done with this world system. But apart from Christ, that's all you're left with. That's what your, what your hope is placed in. Like, that's all you have to cling to is that never-ending pursuit. And let's be honest, it always has that little bit of hope. Well, tomorrow there's going to be more purpose. When my business actually starts to exceed and take off, I get more customers. Then it's going to be, then it's going to be great. Then, or, or, you know, you, you just have this never-ending hope. And before you know it, you're 60, 70, 80 years old. And what happens? Life becomes just a pile of frustrated dreams. Just a pile of frustrated dreams. Because apart from Christ, that's all that you're left with. You're just left with the things that this world has to offer you. How's that going for you? If you think about it, apart from Christ, why not just adopt the philosophy of the Greeks where they said, let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. Well, for tomorrow we die. There's no, there's no hope. You see, apart from Christ, apart from his work on the cross, and that's the beautiful thing here that Paul's saying. He says, man, because of the cross, I'm done with those things. 
past, present, future, sin, forgiven, direction and strength by the Holy Spirit, by the present in our present life, future eternity secure. That's all radically changed because of what happened on Good Friday. Because of what happened on Good Friday. He said, I'm dead to the world. I'm dead to it. It's now, now it's the foundation. Now the cross is the foundation for anything that I do, everything that I enjoy. He continues of how else things change in verse 15. You guys staying with me? All right, you guys all there? All right, verse 15. For neither, circumcis- for neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble. I love that. For I bear in my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. What he's saying here, he starts out again talking about circumcision on Easter. He's saying circumcision doesn't count for anything. Circumcision represents all of our efforts to please God for salvation. He's saying, listen, that doesn't mean diddly. He says the only thing that he's saying there, only thing that matters is whether you're a new creation in Jesus Christ or not. Anybody else watch some of these home makeover shows? I, I, I find myself getting sucked into them. And you, you, it's interesting to me, especially on HGTV, how like one episode, you're like, oh, I'm just going to watch one, one of these. And then it's like six episodes later, you're like, what am I doing? Like, uh, and uh, one, of the, one of the ones that I really like is the, is the, the guy realtor and the girl kind of going toe to toe. And they're trying to fix up the house. You guys know this one that I'm talking about? Trying to fix up the house to see if they want to decide to stay or to move out. And usually I'm watching some of the choices that they're doing to fix up the existing house. And they're like, look, we turned this this, uh, closet into your new living room. And you're like, that doesn't work. It's way too small. You're like, "Or, or this hallway, now that's your grand entrance. And we added a stairwell. And you're like, wait a second, what what's going on here? You needed to start over. You needed to tear that sucker down and go from the ground up. And what's the the exciting thing about what's happened, what Jesus did with us is God looking down on us came to that same exact conclusion, came to that same exact conclusion. He says, I'm not going to start with trying to fix you. I got to make you a completely new creation. That's why you have weird terms in the New Testament of being born born again. What is what is that all about in John 3, 3 or 2 Corinthians 5, 17 that says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, and the new has come. The new has come. You're, you're done with the old. It's a gift. It's exciting. It's something that we should aspire to and look forward to. This, this thing that he's saying here, he's saying, listen, when you've embraced the cross, it changes everything. What does he point them to? He says, and all of us who walk by this rule, in other words, walking by the grace that Jesus offered through the cross, peace and mercy be upon them. All of a sudden, you're able to experience peace and mercy, no longer at odds with Almighty God. Isn't it crazy that Scripture describes us as enemies of God apart from Christ? It's a pretty scary reality to be under, but he's saying, listen, now when you've embraced what Jesus did, his work on your behalf, now you can experience peace. There's no longer, it's not just a conflict with your spouse. You're no longer at odds with almighty God. Mercy, describing that, no longer looming judgment. You're no longer the guy on death row just waiting for when am I going to stand before my maker. That's the invitation He describes it's not just personally, it's collectively. He describes it as the Israel of God. It's the Israel of God is saying not just a not just a national, not just a heritage, not just a ethnicity. The Israel of God represents both people that are Jewish that have embraced Christ and those that are non-Jewish. Thank the Lord for that uh, that have embraced uh, embraced Christ. He's saying you're all part of this new creation. This new creation. I love how he concludes there. You can kind of picture this. He says, from now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. 
I picture this like a like an older guy at the end of his days, and and that you kind of you kind of get that permission as you get a little bit o- older to be a little less tolerant, and to be else feel like you're living in that season of life where you don't have to put up with junk as much, and uh and, and that's what Paul's saying. He's like, listen, he's like, cut it out, cut it out, stop going back to this depending on the flesh. He's like, he's like, look at me. I've got the scars that when he says marks, he's literally talking about scars that he's accumulated from following Christ his entire life. He's saying, look at me. He's like, cut it out. He's like, stop going back to the putting on the show. He's like, stick to what I've taught you. And he leaves them with this simple challenge or this simple plea. He says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. The grace, he's, he's, he started with grace in this book of Galatians and he's going back to grace. Why is that? Because in 50 billion years from now, get your mind around that idea, 50 billion years from now, you're still gonna exist. You're still gonna be exi- exist. And if you're with him eternally with God Almighty, still the same exact thing that you'll be clinging to as you cling on the, to it this Easter 2014 is grace. Grace. Undeserved favor from God. Where God chose, not me reaching up to God, God chose to reach down to you, not after you fixed things, not after you got your life straight, reach down to you exactly where you are at and said, I am intervening on your behalf. That is grace. That's grace. And that's the same thing that we cling to. That's the same thing we celebrate and sing about. And that's the invitation. And my question that I want to leave us with this morning is where are we placing my hope? Finish that line. Finish that that sentence there. We started with, my hope is in question mark. You answer that. I want to give us just a couple moments here just as the worship team comes up, just to be quiet before God and wrestle through that question. Wrestle through that question. Don't leave today without getting that resolved. Don't you think it's a pretty important thing? Don't you think that's a a, a critical question in our lives? My prayer is that now the gift of just a few moments to reflect and think might actually be a, a gift that redirects eternity. Hebrews 4, 7 says, when we hear his voice, don't harden our hearts. This might be for some of you, this might be the very, isn't this crazy to think? This might be the very last time some people hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Like, no, it's not. I'll I'll probably hear it next Easter when I come back to church. Like, I'll I'll be here. I'll hear it again. But the truth is, is that the way that it works is hearts have this tendency to harden. Where at first, maybe there's that little prick, maybe that little appeal to their heart. Maybe that was happening. But the truth is, when we keep ignoring that invitation, that little voice gets quieter and quieter until it stops until it stops. Roman 1 talks about that being turned over to our sin. All right, if that's what you want. So in these moments, I want us to just bow our heads and close our eyes and just wrestle through that simple but critical question, my hope is in. God, on Easter 2014, 
2014 years later, as we celebrate your resurrection, I pray that there wouldn't be anybody in this room that misses that celebration. That was just like, what is that all about? That each person here, this would be the day that they actually choose, make that choice to put their hope in you, be done, quit the human effort thing. God, I just pray that you do that work, God. We know that your Holy Spirit is the only one that can do that work, God. I pray now that you would just be glorified in this last song as we sing of your greatness. I pray that there anybody that is wrestling through that decision, they wouldn't just harden their hearts, that they wouldn't leave today without getting that choice and that decision resolved once and for all for an eternity-altering decision. God, we now submit this to you, God. If there is somebody in here that needs to talk about that or pray about that, I pray they'd feel the freedom at the end of the service to come get that solved, to get that a solution to that question. We submit this last song to you that you'd be pleased and glorified in it as we praise and celebrate you as the risen Lord, the risen God, the one that's seated at the right hand of God the Father on the throne reigning over all. We praise you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. As we close right now, there's really two options of what to do right now. You can either march directly out into your day, but if this hasn't been resolved, that choice of where you're placing your hope, I encourage you to march this direction. March this direction, get someone praying for you. You've got to have elders and staff up here available, getting some questions answered. March this way, not that way. Here's the invitation. If you're a guest with us today, feel free to grab a lily on your way out as a gift from us. Otherwise, we'll see you next week as we're starting a new series working through the book of Titus called A Life Uncommon. Happy Easter. God bless you.